Hey, welcome, or welcome back to Secondhand Overland. As some of you know, my wife and I are into hiking, and when we go, we are surprised quite often by the things we see. This feature of this week's video takes the cake for things we found while hiking. One day after hiking a trail around one of the more famous peaks in the Phoenix area, we exited the preserve on a trail we'd never been down before and it dumped us out into an again unfamiliar residential area. It was here that we came across this, a 1974 Land Rover Series 3 lightweight parked right out in the street. About the same time I realized what I was looking at, the owner Alex greeted us from his patio and then came out and began to tell me all about this impressive vehicle. Personally, I'd never seen a lightweight version of a series Land Rover in the flesh, and in fact, I just always assumed that there wasn't a lot of difference between the consumer and military variants of the series Rovers, and boy, I was wrong. You see, at the same time the United States military was embracing the doctrine of air mobility, so were our closest allies, and in the early 1960s, helicopters just didn't have enough lift to carry a fully dressed series Land Rover. So they had Land Rover create a stripped down version that could be. What they got first was a series two Rover with various removable body panels that could drop the weight to a level that could be carried by the helicopters of the day. And also featured a four inch narrower axle track which allowed it to be set on a standard airlift pallet. When Land Rover moved from the series two to three in civilian production, they introduced the lightweight version for military use which is what we're featuring today. And as if seeing a retired British Army vehicle in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona isn't rare enough, Alex is what's called an FFR model, or as they say, fitted for radio. It was used by the 2nd Battalion of the British Army as a communications truck. Because radios need a lot of power, this vehicle operates on a 24 volt electrical system. I don't think I've ever seen a 24 volt electrical system on anything other than heavy trucks and construction equipment. So I was definitely intrigued. The owner before Alex also put together an interesting scrapbook detailing just about everything you need to know about this or any Series 3 lightweight for that matter. He even had the original build sheets. You see that number plate on the front of the vehicle? That was its radio call sign when it was in service. And what's interesting is that call sign also served as a sort of VIN number for the vehicle which was stamped into about every important place on the vehicle. I've been sitting on this one for a while, kind of waiting for the right time to bring it up. Also, being that it is an old Land Rover, it had an issue at the time we filmed that left it inoperable. And while Alex is a gracious host and offered to let me come back once he had it back up and running and take it for a spin, I've been slammed with a lot of other projects and just haven't had the opportunity to reach out and set up a time. I could have held out a little longer and released this video later after we were able to get together, but it just seemed right since it's Memorial Day weekend and Father's Day is just around the corner and I think you'll see soon enough why we chose to put this out this week. So without any further ado, I'm just gonna let Alex tell you his Land Rover story. This is my fourth Land Rover. Um, it's my first series. Uh, the first one I had was probably uh, one of my favorites, and that was the Defender 90, a 94 Defender 90 NAS. I bought it and about a year later thought I was doing so well because I sold it for about $6,000 more than I bought it for. Um, however, <laughs> Had I held on to it, it'd be worth about $60,000 more than I bought it for, right. so yeah. So then I went from there, after I sold that, I went to a uh, Range Rover Classic, okay. which was a fantastic truck. A lot of time in the shop, but it was a great truck. Had the 3.9 liter uh, Buick motor in it. Then after I got rid of that, I went to a 4.6 HSE, which was another great Land Rover, uh, Range Rover. Ended up blowing a head gasket on that. So moved out of that, had no Land Rover for a while. Started my business in 2011 and sold our cars. We kept one, just, you know, uh, just trying to be prudent. Right. And then as soon as we realized I wasn't gonna, you know, become poor, I uh, started looking around for another Land Rover. And uh, I saw this Series 3 lightweight on LandRoverOwners.org. And I bought it under the auspices of needing a vehicle to transport the dogs in. Uh, my wife was all about it. She wanted a soft top. I wanted something for the dog, so we bought the Series 3. I bought it from a gentleman in uh, Mississippi, uh, somewhat of a Land Rover collector from what I understand. They shipped it up here, and that year there was a hurricane. So it actually got shipped up here through the hurricane. So the top was off, everything was latched down in the back. It got here, it was just completely soaked and, and you know, basically disassembled. So I got it, was very excited, started driving it not so excited. I was getting about 40 miles an hour top speed out of it. 
and realized I was in low gear, put it in high gear, and I was getting about 45 miles an hour <laughs> top speed out of it. Uh, windows rattled, leaked. The steering, I, I always joke, you know, they talk about fly-by-wire. I always called this steer-by-rope because the steering had 180 degrees of play in it. Oh, wow. It was just atrocious. You'd bounce all over the freeway. Shocks were gone. Um, door frames were rusted out. Upper frames, upper doors rusted out. Glass not working, etc. So I started about uh, fixing it bit at a time. You know, started with a new top, uh, got the steering box uh, tightened up, started tidying up the interior, went to new interior seats and backs, lined the truck with uh, quarter inches of uh, pure rubber to uh, cut down on some of the vibration, some of the noise, and in the front, some of the heat. After realizing that uh, I was gonna hold the truck for a long time, I started actually putting some money into it. So started, if I remember correctly, with a new carb, then ended up needing a new starter. Because it's a 24 volt system, I could not find a starter motor for it. Ended up going back home to the UK and digging around. Where my sister lives in the Midlands is uh, a, a, one of the premier uh, Land Rover restorers seemingly. So he kind of steered me in the right direction to find a 24 volt uh, alternator, which I then brought uh, back on the airlines, which uh, surprisingly made it because obviously I'm sure that looked fantastic yeah, in, yeah, the, uh, lot, in the in the X-ray. So did that, um, then then started on uh, brake hubs, brakes, replaced the hubs, replaced replaced the brakes, brake servos, uh, brake lines, new rims, new tires, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, to where it is now. New paint had it stripped down. We uh, re-primed uh, and painted. And all of this because, I, as I said, I had decided I was going to keep it because, as I mentioned earlier to you, there's a connection to this truck right. that uh, was really, really uh, rather, rather surprising, to right. be honest. When I got the truck, it was military, and I knew it had come over from the UK, being right-hand drive, obviously, or Australia, but it, it turned out to be the UK. And it was actually attached to 2nd Division of the British Army. And 2nd Division is uh, based in Edinburgh. And what's ironic is my father was, was from just outside of Edinburgh. So I thought, oh, what an interesting, uh, interesting connection. Well, then as I started reading it, I realized that Catrick Garrison is also part of 2nd Division. And I was actually physically born on, on Catrick Garrison with my father when he was in the, the Royal Signals. So as I looked at it, there was more and more that tied it to me and my father. My father uh, died in 78. And this is a 74. So, you know, there was a, uh, and he died just as he got out of the army. So as I started seeing those connections, I felt more and more tied to it. So this was actually attached to the division of the garrison that I was born on, um, that my father was obviously stationed at at the time. So, you know, pretty much I don't see ever, uh, I honestly don't see ever giving it up. And as I said, I've got big dogs. They fit in the back a bit. It's fantastic. And uh, I drive it. Uh, it's not daily because it's Arizona, so it gets a bit warm in the uh, summer, but I drive it several times a week all year long, and when the weather's a little more agreeable, I drive it every day, you know? It's, it's literally become my daily driver. I love it. About the furthest I got, I took it up to Four Peaks okay. in Arizona and did a little off-roading in it. Um, and we were talking earlier about the fact it's got the ferry overdrive. Right. Uh, it will literally go anywhere. Yeah. Even though it's 70 horsepower, it will literally go anywhere because you've got, I can't remember the number, something like 32 forward gears in that thing with all the combinations. Two wheel, four wheel drive with four forward gears. Oh, wow. Four wheel uh, drive low with four forward gears. And then every single one of those gears has a 1.66 splitter. Okay. So to, to, you know, because the 70 horsepower isn't necessarily the most powerful. Uh -huh. So you can go one, 1.6, two, 2.6, three, 3.6, four, 4.6 overdrive. Dang. And you can do that in two wheel low, two wheel high, four wheel low, four wheel high. After I bought it, before I'd had a chance to really go through it, but was anxious to drive it, um, I took it on the freeway down here and as I turned onto the freeway, I heard a strange tinkling sound and didn't know what it was, didn't pay any attention. Get on the freeway, get up to top speed, which was about 50 miles an hour at the time. I'm in the middle lane, I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, the whole truck lurches down on the front left. I grab the steering wheel, look up, 
and the front left wheel has come off. And as you can imagine, without the truck to, to weigh it down, the wheel picked up speed pretty quickly. I literally put the turn signal on and dragged the truck over into the parking lane. And I sat there and watched as the wheel bounced. It was bouncing about five, six foot up, bounced across three lanes of traffic. And it was a busy day. Yeah. And what shocked me was everybody was just slowing down and speeding up to avoid the bouncing wheel. And as it hit the center, I thought if it crosses that center, it's gonna kill somebody because it's gonna go into the oncoming traffic. It hits the center lane, hits the concrete barricade, bounces back across the freeway. Some of the same people slowing down and speeding up to miss it. And it comes to stop at the far side of the freeway, about a quarter of a mile up the road. I see a guy in a pickup truck, pulls up, picks up the tire, throws it in the back of the pickup truck, puts it in reverse, reverses down the breakdown lane, the emergency lane, all the way to me, looks at me and he goes, dude, he goes, I've never seen that many sparks in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I call my wife, she brings the floor jack down. Um, I see one lug nut, which obviously was the final lug nut right. sitting in the middle lane. I play a little frog, I go get the lug nut, take one lug nut off each of the other three wheels, so now they all have four, bolted it back on, drove it home. Absolutely zero damage. The, the, the left front hub was a bit flat on the front, but uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> so that was my introduction to uh, what can go wrong. It could have been much worse. And now it's just a good story. Right. Yeah, it could have been a horrible story. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so, so that, is, that is my Land Rover story front to back, man. That's so amazing. Well, hopefully now you see why we just had to feature this one. And if you've enjoyed it, please hit that like button. And if you're new here, subscribe so you never miss another video like this one. We also just launched a new Secondhand Overland Facebook group. So head over there, drop in, say hi, and throw up some dirty pictures of your old rig for the rest of us to oogle at. As always, I'm Matt Kester. You can find me on Instagram at Frugal Explorer Dad. Until next time, be good.